Morning, everyone. Morning. It's nice to welcome you all to church this uh, summer's day, a beautiful, another beautiful day in Granton. So it's lovely to welcome you all and to have you all worshiping here with us. And welcome as well to that part of our church family that is joining us online this morning as well. So if we do our usual check in, uh, we usually finish with those in the church, but if I ask those in the church, first of all, to give a wave to all those online so that you can see them there. There you go. We wave from us. And to those who are joining online, we have people from Edinburgh. Give us a wave. There we are. We have people from Barnet down in London. Thank you for the wave there. We've got Cardiff. Yeah. And we've got Italy. And we have got Greenwich as well. So nice to have you all joining. And as we gather together, we say there's, there's no physical distance and barrier to joining together to worship in God's family and the wonders of modern technology help us to do that. Now, before we start, there's one or two we notice this. As always, we're looking for volunteers for our various ministry programs to, to get going again. Uh, that includes everything from, do you want to take part in the services to do you want to help with tea and coffee at the back after the service? And so we are looking, we, we had our kind of uh, our break when we weren't allowed to meet and we are now looking to kind of get things going again and it's an opportunity not necessarily to do everything the same way or even to do the same things but is an opportunity to get involved in perhaps something new that you've never done before so do let me know if you want to help out with anything like that now we're looking for some help not on site next saturday so granton goes greener which is as you know um one of our community projects we have, I think the phrase would be, we have gained the use of the police box in Leith, right? So, so that's, I'm trying to think, yeah, we have gained the use of the police box in Leith for a couple of hours. They run community projects out of it. And so we are going to run Grant and Ghost Greener out of the community police box in Leith for a couple of hours this Saturday. And so Anna is looking for some volunteers for Saturday. If you can spare a couple of hours, do you want to speak? Um, All right, yeah, here you go. You speak. <laughs> Sorry, I just, I, I just came at the right time. Um, so for this Saturday, um, it's uh, myself and it was Sandra who was offered to help, and I think it's Ian as well. Um, so uh, we're planning to be at the police box uh, at 10 o'clock, uh, set everything up. So I think for the morning we should be fine, uh, but it's usually quite busy, uh, I would say, between um, 11 and 2, 3 p.m. Um, and obviously like uh, you have to be watching, especially that we have some uh, vintage clothes that would like to sell and make like few pounds uh, for the project. Um, but um, Leaf Oak Police Box is the place that you need to be watching like different, uh, different customers. So I think we would need like at least uh, two of us at the store all the time. So if anybody would like to help, uh, even for like one hour, uh, please let me know. And uh, I'm not sure if Norman has uh, mentioned the climate festival uh, at Leaf Links Park. No, no. no so that's 14th of August. Uh, so if you can check your diaries, because again, this is like another really, really busy day. And I think we're looking at the setup from as early as maybe like 8, 9 a.m. Uh, until about 4, 5 p.m. So very long day. And if anybody could spare a few hours to help on that day, uh, that would be really appreciated. And again, um, you can go home, think about it, and um, if you figure out like your, your schedule for 14th of August, uh, you can let me know. Okay, thank you. Great timing, Anna. Thank you. Well done. And I'm also going to ask Ian, because Ian's got uh, another notice to share with us this morning as well. Good morning. As a congregation, we are committed to responding to emergency appeals from Christian Aid, and we have one this morning. It's the Christian Aid Global Hunger Appeal. Uh, more than 30 million people in 20 countries are living on the brink of famine. The COVID-19 pandemic, violent conflict, and the climate crisis have all contributed to people in these countries facing starvation. Uh, people in countries like South Sudan, Afghanistan, Burkina Faso are facing this threat of hunger. The families need food and clean water, and that is what we are asked to help with. 
Uh, there are not the usual envelopes that we have at these appeals because of the COVID restrictions, but there is a box at the back door of the church. Uh, and if you would like to make a donation uh, towards this appeal, if you could put your money in the box as you leave this morning. For those of you who are not in the church today, it is possible to make a contribution also by going to the Christian Aid website. Thank you. We are still not allowed to sing in our level. Um, we can listen to music, but we can speak. And so we start our service with our antiphonal psalm, and it will appear up there on the screen, and I'll read the first bit, and then if you respond as a congregation with the bits in bold. The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. He gives me new strength. He guides me in the right paths as he has promised. You prepare a banquet for me where all my enemies can see me. You welcome me as an honored guest and fill my cup to the brim. Thanks be to God for that reading from his word. Uh, the music group are going to lead us in our first musical piece today, which is Morning Has Broken. Um, do feel free to hum along to the words as you so wish. We're going to travel all the way south now to London, to Barnet, and to Dorothy. And Dorothy, you think you're going to lead us in our first reading this morning from Genesis. The reading is taken from the book of Genesis, chapter 40, starting at verse 1. Sometime after this, the cupbearer of the king of Egypt and his baker offended their lord, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, in the prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and he waited on them, and they continued for some time in custody. One night they both dreamed, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in the prison, each his own dream and each dream with its own meaning. When Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they were troubled. So he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in custody in his master's house, why are your faces downcast today? They said to him, 
We have had dreams and there is no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Please tell them to me. So the chief cupbearer told his dream, his dream to Joseph and said to him, in my dream, there was a vine before me and on the vine, there were three branches. As soon as it budded, its blossoms came out and the clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. Then Joseph said to him, this is its interpretation. The three branches are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office and you shall place Pharaoh's cup in his hand, just as you used to do when you were his cup bearer. But remember me when it is well with you. Please do me the kindness to make mention of me to Pharaoh. And so get me out of this place. For in fact, I was stolen out of the land of the Hebrews. And here also I have done nothing that they should have put me into the dungeon. Thanks be to God for his word. Thank you, Dorothy. Um, that's a really interesting story. It's an interesting story about the dream. And we tend to get all kind of caught up on the dream. But it doesn't actually start with the dream because he could have the dream and that could finish it it starts when joseph says to him tell me your dream so joseph says to him go on i want to hear your dream tell me your story and then the whole adventure kicks off from the point of view of that happening and there's a wee picture a kind of stylized picture of the two of them having a wee chat here that you can kind of look at on the screen and um i'm betting that one of the things that you might have enjoyed doing since lockdown has begun to ease is just being physically in someone else's company. Is that right? You just like being physically in someone else's company. And you might start off not with tell me your dream, but these two questions here on the screen. How are you? Or as you might say in the Northeast, fit like. All right. Fit like Anna means how are you? But it's in a, it's in a dialect called Doric that they speak in the northeast of uh, Scotland. I could give you the northwest one, which is Damon Howe, which equivalent translates to how are you, All right? So how many times have you asked someone, how are you in the past week? Put your hands up if you asked one person, how are you, All right? All right? Keep your hand up if you asked four or five people, how are you? 10 people, you're saying, I don't know 10 people or more, right? Keep your hand up if you've ever asked someone, how are you? And after listening to them for 10 or 15 minutes, you're thinking, I wish I hadn't asked that question. Right. OK, you're thinking, oh, my gosh, all I expected was you to say what Scottish people always say, which is, I'm fine. That's right. So when Joseph asked, the, I said, tell me your dream, he could easily have turned around and said, no, no, I'm fine. But by asking the question of someone else, they embarked on this whole adventure. Now, how equipped do you feel when someone does actually start telling you everything to go on that adventure with them? Mm -hmm. So I've got another picture to show you here. I Googled said adventure kit, right? And this was somebody's adventure kit. Okay, so when you look at it, um, you've got the sleeping bag, you've got the first aid kit, you've got the compass, you've got the whistle, you've got the lights. The mobile phone, I thought, was an interesting one. Uh, you better have some way, or they better have some way of charging it. Otherwise, they're going to run out of charge. Um, but one of the big things now is an app called What Three Words. Every bit of the world is put into three words. So if you text your three words to the mountain rescue, they know exactly where you are. Um, the axe, interesting, the knife, canteen and all these kind of things. That looks like a pretty good adventure kit, isn't it? Survival kit, yeah. But, but that's not the first thing that you actually need. Right? That's not the first thing that you actually need. Can any of you think of the first thing that you actually need? Not a map. Anyone, anyone online having a guess the first thing you actually need? You're welcome to shout it out. Let me tell you, it's you have to have an interest in going. 
right? So when you look at all these things, could anyone here put roughly a survival kit together from their house? Right, hands up, you think you could do that, right. Why are you still here? Okay, so if we can put that together on our house, right, and we have all this stuff, and how often do we buy something saying, I think I might need that, but, but what happens to it? We car boot it years later down the line because we never actually use it. So the first thing actually is not to have all of this. It's actually to have the, the intention and the interest in going. And Joseph, because Joseph was doing things in that house, when he heard the other guy complaining and saying, I had this dream, I have no idea what this dream means. You know what he could have done? He could have just listened and thought, oh, whatever. And he could have carried on with what he was doing. But he had an interest, he had enough interest to say, tell me your dream. And so one of the things that comes out of this is not the dream in itself, it's the challenge to say, are we interested enough in other people to say to them, how are you? Are we even interested enough in, other, in the person that we know when we ask that question, it's going to be 20 minutes out of our life to say to them, how are you? And to go on a wee adventure. We are going to talk more about this whole thing later on, but that is just a wee something to think about. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, you said, follow me, and people followed you. You called people to go into this world. You commissioned people to go into this world to be salt and light, to be your hands and your feet. You gave us a job to go and make disciples. You sent us, Father, out. And so we go on this great adventure with you. We go where you have been. We recognize, Father, that we are not an inward looking group of believers, but that we are an outward looking group of believers. We want to see this world transformed. We want to see lives changed. And yet we recognize you have called people who are timid and fearful and worried that we get things wrong and worried that we don't have the right equipment, worried that we don't have the right motivation, all of these things, but yet you have made no other plans for you. You have called us and you have commissioned us. So, Father, as we gather together as a congregation of your people, and as people all over this world come together in Christian community, our prayer is that you would not just equip, but that you would encourage and that you would inspire your people to adventure with you to go to places where they have never been, to see lives change, to see your kingdom grow, and to see that you are God and how much you love this world. For Father, we know that you sent your son, and we know that that was because there was no limit and no bounds on your love for this world. So hear this, our prayer. And Father, we join together now, as we know people all over the world join together, and we say together the words that Jesus gave us. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Alan, you care to lead us in our next reading. Our second reading is from the book of Acts, reading chapter 8, starting at verse 26. Philip and the Ethiopian official. An angel of the Lord said to Philip, get ready and go south to the road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. This road is not used nowadays. So Philip got ready and went. Now an Ethiopian eunuch, who was an important official in charge of the treasury of the Queen of Ethiopia, was on his way home. He had been to Jerusalem to worship God and was going back home in his carriage. As he rode along, he was reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The Holy Spirit said to Philip, go over to that carriage and stay close to it. Philip ran over and heard him reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. He asked him, do you understand what you are reading? The official replied, 
How can I understand unless someone explains it to me? And he invited Philip to climb up and sit in the carriage with him. The passage of scripture which he was reading was this. Like a sheep that is taken to be slaughtered, like a lamb that makes no sound when its wool is cut off, he did not say a word. He was humiliated and justice denied him. No one will be able to tell about his descendants because his life on earth has come to an end. The official asked Philip, tell me, of whom is this prophet saying this, of himself or of someone else? Then Philip began to speak. Starting from this passage of scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled down the road, they came to a place where there was some water, and the official said, here is some water. What is to keep me from being baptized? The official ordered the carriage to stop, and both Philip and the official went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord took Philip away. The official did not see him again, but continued on his way full of joy. Philip found himself in Azotus. He went on to Caesarea, and on the way he preached the good news in every town. Amen. May God add his blessing to this word. I'm going to show you a picture. Um, if you're of a certain age, you'll remember this. If you are uh, less than that age, you will not remember this. So do you remember that? Remember how much it cost? Seven and six. That's right. Seven and six. When you beat someone in golf by seven holes, uh, it's called the dog license because it costs seven and six. This is a picture of a dog license. Um, if you own an air rifle in Scotland, guess what? You need to have a license now. Can't own one of these without a uh, license. If you own a car, guess what? You need a license. Now, if you own a TV, do you need a license? Yes, that's right. And it's a criminal offense if you don't have a license, right? Actually, how many of you own a computer? How's it you own a computer? Hands up if you own the computer software. Actually, most of the time you don't. Most of the time you're licensing a copy of the computer software and they are allowing you to use it. But if you read the um, however many tens, maybe hundreds of pages, it tells you that at any point the company can revoke the license. So you're in a sense paying for the use of it. Um, you may also have owned a firearm. Has anyone ever owned a firearm? Uh, I know one person in our congregation who's owned a firearm in the past, but if you do, you need a license. And not only do you need a license, you need a visit to certify that you're sane. And then the police will check that up to make sure that, that you are sane. Um, a lot of stuff is deemed to be so dangerous that you cannot even get a license for it. And that is quite rightly so. Heavy weapons, viruses, terrorist stuff, all that kind of stuff. These things are far too dangerous for people in the public and in no way should anyone have them. And yet, I have to tell you, I have found something that has slipped the net. I have found something that is really dangerous that you and I can own, and I'm not sure whether we should own it or not. And this something has got the capacity to completely blow up a society. Now I'm going to show you a different type of, of kind of picture. This one here, believe it or not, is a hellfire missile, right? This is a scary thing. It's called a fire and forget missile, which means that once you press the button, you can't take it back. It's got a wee brain in itself, and it says, I'm going here, I'm going there, until it finds its target. They call it a tank buster. Um, and does it say, once it's gone, you can't take it back? Well, see the thing I found? Once you unleash it, you can't leash it again. It is a scary, scary thing. And the most scary thing about this thing I found is that when people and governments have tried to ban it, they have failed miserably because a whole group of people had a career in smuggling this thing. And they even found really creative ways to smuggle it into countries, um, really creative ways. And, and governments really understood how dangerous it was, but they failed to stop it. And now the most amazing thing is you can buy this weapon on Amazon. It's openly for sale. It's ridiculous how easy it is to get. You know exactly what I'm talking about, don't you? What am I talking about? 
you're saying, I'm not taking a guess in case I get it wrong. It's this. It is the Bible that I am, of course, talking about. Um, there is a Christian charity called Open Doors, and Open Doors is, is an interesting charity in that it tracks Christian persecution across the world. I'm going to show you a map here. This map, um, the darker red the country, the more Christian persecution is going on in there. <clears throat> and in many of the countries that are really deep red, they have banned or tried to ban uh, the Bible. So, I mean, you got to ask yourself, why ban the Bible? The Bible is a book about God's love. It says God loves the world. It says God so loved the world that he sent his son into the world. Why on earth would you ban that? That's a great message for anyone. It tells you to look after the poor. tells you to take care of the widows. It talks about equality, all of these things. Why ban it? Well, it also talks about fighting for the oppressed. It talks about resisting unjust authorities. It says that God sees everyone equally, both poor and rich alike. It says that ultimately we will all be held to God's standard, whomever we are. And it talks about Jesus as being the way to salvation. Well, no autocratic government wants to hear these things. They don't. And so what has their response been? They've tried to ban the Bible. And yet, for, the, for a large part of our world, the Bible has been the most effective means of change that our world has ever experienced. Now, I'm going to show you a series of images, and I want you to tell me if you're up for the responsibility of these things, okay? So here is the first thing. This man, and he died in June, he was the head of the world's largest family. He had 38 wives, he had 89 children, and at the point of his death, he had 36 grandchildren. Hands up if you would like the responsibility of being head of that family. I mean, without Google Calendar, I wouldn't have a hope with the birthdays, right? Nobody's raising their hands and saying they want to be part of that family. Okay, I'm going to show you another one, right? This man is sitting with something called a Tibetan Mastiff dog. A Chinese businessman bought one of these dogs for $1.6 million at a luxury pet fair. Hands up if you want the responsibility of taking that for a walk down the beach at Cramond. Nobody, nobody's putting their hand up. Oh dear, oh dear. Right, this is the world's most expensive car right? Which cost millions of pounds. Hands up if you would like to, the responsibility of having to reverse park it in Edinburgh streets. No, no, okay, well, okay, that's not working either. Right, this is the world's most expensive suit. It retails at £599,000, and yes, those are real diamonds. It is made by a company called Stuart Hughes in Manchester, do you fancy the responsibility of sitting down to eat your spaghetti bolognese wearing that suit? That's a no. Oh, dear. Okay. This is the Bible. This is the Word of God. The stories that have been contained within this book have changed societies. They've removed slavery. They've improved working conditions. They've enshrined ideas of human equality and dignity and freedom. Do you feel up to the responsibility of being given this book? Because we have been given this book. When the Apostle Paul was coaching his young prodigy, Timothy, he wrote these words. He said, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching the truth, rebuking error, correcting faults, and giving instruction for right living, so that the person who serves God may be fully qualified and equipped to do every kind of good deed. The Bible is not a book. It is not a collection of stories. The Bible is a gift given from God. And it is an awesome, awesome responsibility that he has given to you and to me because inside is the story of Jesus, a story that has changed this world. And <clears throat> When you and I look at it, we really need to get this because we don't get this. You know why? Because it's everywhere and it's dirt cheap to us. You can see it. If you walk into a secondhand bookshop, they usually often don't put the Bibles out because they get so many given in. 
Right? We just we we think it's it's worth peanuts, so we treat it as peanuts. But it is the most useful thing that God has given to us. Now, remember that car I showed you earlier, the world's most expensive car. Here it is beside the UK's most popular car. Okay, you see that? The UK's most popular car, not necessarily the color, is a Vauxhall Corsa. Now, if you were taking the kids out, which car would you prefer to have? If you were taking the dog to the beach and back, which car would you prefer to have? If you were nipping down to the church, which car would you prefer to have? You're probably going to say at that point, I'd love to have a supercar, but no, that wouldn't do good. Right, it's more useful than the other one. And we have been given a really practical gift to be used in everyday life. Let's get rid of that picture. Now, let's go on to the next one. Oh, that's fine. Really break next. Um, so don't take it for granted. Don't underestimate the usefulness of God's word. Don't for one minute think this is a harmless book. It's not. It has changed the world in ways the world was not ready for, but God was. Now, why cover all this <clears throat> in a reading about the Ethiopian official? <clears throat> well, the Ethiopian official was reading the Bible when Philip turned up. And when Philip spoke to him, he explained to him how the Bible related, and he answered the question that he had, which was essentially, what's going on here? Tell me about this. And so he took him through all that. So the Holy Spirit brought Philip and the official and the Bible together. And after, the, after Philip left, the official went home with the scrolls. He went home with his new understanding, but we don't know what happened then. Now, one of the interesting things today is you might have heard of some of, of, of the Ethiopian church. It is the oldest branch of Christianity that currently exists. For all we know, it could go back to this encounter. And that's what's the Once the Bible is set loose, once God's word goes out there, there is no telling, actually, the impact it will have on society. All of this coming from people's encounter with God's word. The same Bible that you and I have, the same Bible we so often leave gathering on a shelf. I remember uh, many, many years ago, um, being a child, you go through phases. When you're growing up, the first thing you're told is don't touch. Isn't that right? You're told don't touch. Then you're told you can touch these things. And then there's a rite of passage that comes at some point when you're allowed to look through what's stored in the chest of drawers or, or the cupboards or something. And there is magic in there. And I distinctly remember going through, we had a chest of drawers that was, uh, was under the windowsill. And we were told, no, no, there's nothing in there for you. Oh, okay. And I, I remember one day getting to go through and I found this thing. It was a white box. And inside it was a white book. That was absolutely pristine. Can any of you guess what the white book might have been? But it wasn't just a Bible. It was a wedding presentation Bible that was given to my mom and dad on the day that they got married. And it became so precious to them that they kept it in the drawer in the sideboard for years, and it only saw the light of day when the youngest child, who was told, wash your hands before you touch that, went and had a scrounge around the cupboards. That is not what the Bible is for. It is for everyday use. Now, we're going to come back to this in a moment, but we're going to have our video break. We're not having a song today. Uh, since we're on the kind of spirit and theme of adventure today, um, I thought I would show you this. And I'm sure some of you have seen this, but it's essentially when Bear Gorillas met Barack Obama. I'm holding that book, Do you know the thing I was most worried about on this whole trip? What's that? Just keeping you safe. I'm skinny, but I'm talking about what? You are. Well, we've, we've made it. Mission accomplished. Thank you. Can I pray for you before we go? Absolutely. One of the things I really wanted to do was to be able to say a little prayer with him, and it's always awkward doing that. But, um, you know, here's a man who really has the weight of the world on his shoulders, and everyone's always taking from him. 
And I just wanted just for 10 seconds just to be able to pray for him and, and for protection over the incredible stuff he's doing. Lord, I thank you for the presence, grace, strength, the courage and character. Bless and protect his work and his family. Uh, forgive us when we fall short and help us be strong in you. Amen. Amen. Appreciate you, Amazing. man. Amazing. Thank you. Bless. Honestly, it's been such a privilege. It's a wonderful time. As I said, I'm genuinely yeah. I'm in awe of what you're doing to protect our planet. Well, you are a great ambassador for the wilderness. And uh, I promise I, I will not invite you to a cocktail party. <laughs> um, I might make an exception for you, Mr. President. Well, maybe, yeah, <laughs> but maybe we'll get to scale the face of, uh, of the White House. Safe journey, Aaron. Thank you. Don't get attacked by a bear. I will. Secret Service is over to you. Not only imagine going on an adventure with Barack Obama, but imagine saying to him on kind of worldwide TV at the end, let's pray together. You know, that's the equivalent of Joseph saying, tell me the dream, which is quite an amazing, an amazing thing. Now, one of the recurring themes of the New Testament, as we kind of keep going through it, is this. It doesn't start but with telling people they are wrong. I often ask you to look at the people around you. Go look at the person who's closest to you in the church. Look at them. Right? Do you think they are right? Do you? And one or two of you might be sitting beside your spouse, so that's a difficult question for you. Um, but do you think that they're right? In fact, I want you to say to them quite plainly, you are wrong. Go on, say to them. Say to them, you are wrong. And if you're on Zoom, say to the person either in the room or beside you or in the box next door to you, say to them, you are wrong. Right. Yeah, have you said that? I didn't hear you say it, so say it a wee bit louder. You are wrong. All right, now that you've said that, say, Jesus loves you. All right, you see how it doesn't really work? It doesn't really work. When you go through the Bible and you actually hear and read the stories that you find there, they don't start by saying, looking at someone and going, sinner, or you're doomed. They don't start with that and saying these things. They start by saying questions like, how are you? Tell me the dream. Or start with questions like, What's going on here? I don't understand this. And Philip's saying, let me tell you about it. And what you end up with is a conversation where the person of faith helps the person who is seeking, searching, questioning to understand. That's what it goes. It's a kind of slowly revealing conversation. Now, let's pull up the next slide. Where is it? Here we go. Right. How can I understand unless someone explains it to me? And he invited Philip to climb in. It's essentially saying, what does this mean? That's what he was asking. What does this mean? And Philip then took him through the story and said, let me tell you what it means. He was willing to go on that adventure with the Ethiopian official. And what we can tell by this is Philip was not trying to answer every single one of this person's intellectual questions about faith. He wasn't trying to give him every single answer. He literally was saying, here's what this story means, and leaving that then with him. If you and I think that to get in someone engaged with faith, we have to go through every last question until we wear them out. It will be doing that till the cows come home. And you remember how I said it in the introductory talk, you meet someone and you don't want to ask them how they are because you know that that's 20 minutes of your life. Well, if we were to go through every single question they had, I guarantee you we would run out of friends really quickly. No one would want us to come and see them. Rather, it's about the conversation that helps them understand where it fits into their life. So there you are having coffee with your neighbor or your work colleague and they tell you how hard life is. Maybe tell you one of their kids is struggling in school. Maybe tell you one of their parents is ill. Well, what does faith actually mean in that situation? What does it mean to sit down with them in that situation? There we are sitting with someone who says, you know, it's been a really tough lockdown. I have spent every waking working hour sitting in front of a computer screen, not really seeing anyone. But what does faith mean in that situation? Or to the, the parent who says, I can't face homeschooling another day, it's driving me up the wall. What does faith mean to that situation? And to the child who says, I can't take another day being taught by my parents. 
What does faith mean in that situation as well? There, there's, a really, um, there's a really stupid little computer game that was put together years ago. <clears throat> and I've got a picture of it on the screen here. Do any of you recognize that computer game? Do any of you recognize what it's called? Tetris, that's right. Can I just tell you, it's a brilliant computer game, right? I mean, you can kiss hundreds of hours goodbye. So if you look at it, right, you see that one wee gap with the four black things, right? The aim of Tetris is that when a level, when you, make, when you fill the space, it disappears. So you have to get the right shape into the right space. And as it goes on, it gets faster and faster and more complicated kind of thing as it goes. But it's only when all the shapes fit together that they disappear. And I thought, you know, this is a really good illustration of this. It was when the shapes fitted together that the Ethiopian official, that the lights went off. Right? So you and I, our job is not to fix things or to fix people, but when we introduce them to God's word or when, when we talk about God or faith with them, we're literally trying to help them put the shapes together in their life and for things then to work out. Now, one of the big challenges, and it's a big challenge for me more than uh, anyone else, I think, is that I love chatting to people. I love having coffee with people. And very often I can see the opportunity. I know what I should do. And guess what I do? I run away from it. I go right away. And at the end of it, I'm kicking myself saying, oh, I really should have spoken to them about that. And we all do that. We all do that. But the opportunities are there if we take them. Now, I'm going to show you something else. One or two of you will definitely recognize this. You may have one. You may be in the profession that deals with it. Um, does anyone recognize what that is? Yes, Pat. It's a hip replacement. That's right. That is, a, that's what, when I Googled something called titanium hip, that is what came up. Well, this week uh, on Monday, Pauline and I were watching, uh, we were watching Andy Murray in his first match. And John McEnroe was commentating. And Andy Murray does not have a titanium hip, but he has got a metal plate in his hip. I, th I think it's the where the cartilage is, something like I, I can't. But it's um, McEnroe kept going on about it, and uh, McEnroe um, kept kept going on and saying, "Look at him dancing around the court, and he's got that metal in his hip. This is amazing. It's it's phenomenal." I thought, I thought, I wonder what the NHS tells us about hips. So I went and had a Goog I Googled NHS hip replacement, and, and this is probably a wee bit of, you know, thinking of about years ahead, might need to know this. Um, and so this is what they say in the recovery. This is lifted directly from the NHS website. It says, the staff will help you to get up and walk as quickly as possible after surgery. If you've had minimally invasive surgery or are on an enhanced recovery program, you may, and this shocked me, you may be able to walk on the same day as your operation. That is staggering. Initially, you'll feel discomfort. I read that as howling agony. While walking and exercising, your legs and feet may be swollen, is what they put after. I thought, I won't feel that because of the drugs that I'm on. A physiotherapist will teach you exercises to help strengthen you. And then I thought, they will inflict more pain on me. Yet yeah, to to help strengthen uh, your hip and explain what should and should not be done after the operation. They'll teach you how to bend and sit to avoid damaging your new hip. And then it says going home. You'll usually be in hospital around three to five days, depending on the progress you make and what type of surgery you have. If you're generally fit and well, the surgeon may suggest an enhanced recovery program where you start walking on the day of the operation and are discharged within one to three days. That is staggering. See, I grew up on carry-on films, carry-on matron, carry-on doctor, where the person was put into traction for six months. But not now. Now they're told, and you can sum it up in one word, and one phrase, and the phrase is this, use it or lose it. That's the phrase. And so they're saying when you're given the gift, you get out there and you start using it. And what they will not let you do, to coin an American phrase, is sit on your butt. 
You are not allowed to sit on your butt and say, I'm sore. They will force you to get up and to move and to use the thing. And one of the things I find really interesting is, you know, God gave us his word. He gave us his spirit. And what does he tell us? He tells us, use it or lose it. Get off your butt. Get out there and have the adventure. And what do we most enjoy doing? We most enjoy sitting on our butts. That's what we most enjoy doing. Now, I want you to come on a wee trip with me. And the wee trip is 2,000 years ago to Galilee. Here's a picture of the wee trip. Right. Where are we going? I want you to imagine that you're a fisherman or a fisherwoman. And this man, whom you've heard about, his name is Jesus. He comes up to you and he says, what does he say? He says, follow me. Follow me. That's right. What do you say? Well, I, I know what I would say. Let me tell you what I would say. I would say this. Uh, where are we going? Uh, what are we going to do? Who's going to look after my business? Can you show me how we are going to support ourselves, please? Um, um, I would like to know, are you covering the national insurance contribution? And uh, where's the pension payments coming out of this, please? Um, is there somewhere to store my stuff? Um, I'd love to come with you, Jesus. But I don't like Andrew. You know, we don't get on very well. And uh, for how long are we going? That's kind of the thing that we would do. But that's not what Jesus said. Jesus says, follow me. And so you and I are invited to go on an adventure by Jesus, every one of us. We do not know where it will take us. And this next bit's really important. You will not be in control. Let me say that again. You will not be in control. God is. He's given us his, the tools. He's given us his word. He's given us his spirit. And so what do we say? What we say is let's adventure together. Tell me the dream. Explain this to me. And Jesus says, follow me. Now, it is our practice in this church that whenever we finish a kind of sermon, we have two or three minutes, just turn to the people around about you, and we throw a question up here and there's a chance to chat. And so here's the question today. Where do you want to go with God? That's it. Three or four minutes to chat. Where do you want to go with God? So, on you go.
All right, folks, if we come back, you can always keep these conversations going after tea and coffee at the end. And we're going to turn towards our prayers for others, which today are being led by Leslie. And so this is a slight uh, role reversal in the sense of folks, when Chaz, when folks shout out names here, can you type them into chat? And then Leslie will pick up the names from chat. So is there, and if you're on Zoom, if you type the names into chat, Leslie will pick them up from chat. So are there any names that you want to be remembered for by name today? And we've got one which is Alec. Any other names? Yeah. Right. Jill. Rona and Kenny. Any more? Jane. Jane. Yeah. Any more? Jean. Jean. Okay. Any more names? Leslie, let us know when she get all these. Yep, that's fine. I can see them. Uh... All right. Yep. Okay. Um, he cast all your cares upon him. He cares for you. So says the words of scripture. And let's just take a moment to, to bring to mind our concerns and cares. Um, and there's still a bit of time if anyone wants to, to type in anything else. Okay. Okay, let, let's pray. Gracious and loving Heavenly Father, who loves each one of us without measure, we thank you for your eternal care and are grateful that you are always approachable and accessible to us. And we thank you for this earth, this wonderful world that we've so damaged. We're in awe at your creation and the resilience of the natural world but we need to be better stewards for your sake and for the sake of all life on this planet. Help each of us to be wise in our choices and actions. And we also pray for governments and industry that you will place over them leaders who will make this a priority way beyond money or power or any other thing. And so we also pray particularly for those who are suffering from or, or dealing with natural disasters at this time. We think of the wildfire spreading in British Columbia as a result of the incredibly um, high temperatures there. And for the city of Atami in Japan, where they're still searching for survivors of the landslide. And for all of those things, Lord, that perhaps haven't made the international news, but have caused suffering and despair and uh, mourning. We pray for comfort and healing there. And for our leaders nationally and internationally, this is still a time when decisions have to be made often without historical precedent to guide us. And when the cost of error is potentially so high, we ask for political leaders, advisors and policy makers who have wisdom, compassion and integrity. Be with them as they make decisions about the economy, about international relations, and about COVID and the restrictions, um, the decisions that they will make in the coming days and weeks as infection figures in various areas rise again. We pray for our communities. And here in Granton, in, in the last week, we have seen the results of violence. A hit and run in Pilton, two men viciously attacked, um, in Granton Square and for the victims and their loved ones, we ask for healing, for peace and for your comfort. And Lord, wherever we are, we pray for those who live in fear um, of violence or um, and, and, and we just pray for your comfort, your protection for them and show us where it is our role to protect the vulnerable and the weak. And we pray, Lord, for your church. In so much of the Western world, your church is struggling to fulfill your mission. And many denominations are in a time of planning and change. We pray for leaders locally, regionally and nationally and beyond who have vision, courage and integrity so that your will may be done. That we are not part of a church that is trying to save itself, but part of a church that in your name wants to save the world. And for those people we're concerned for, for the names and situations we bring to you now, 
and also for those we hold in the silence of our hearts. We pray for Pat, for Angus, Winnie, for Alex, for Jill, for Rona and Kenny, for Michael, Fagan, James and family, for Jane and for Jean and for Alan. And Lord, we commit them to your ministry and to your loving care and ask that in your mercy and grace, you meet their deepest needs. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Leslie. We are going to call our music group at this point as we draw ourselves to a close. And uh, this song is called My Heart is Filled with Thankfulness. Thank you everyone for joining us in worship today. Um, if you are on Zoom, can we um, say cheerio to you now? And I know you're gonna go off and have your tea and coffee at home and chat through there. So everyone on Zoom gets a wave and get away from everyone on Zoom. Yeah, see you again. Uh, and if you are here, if you're wanting tea and coffee, it's table service only under COVID regulations. So if you go to the back and you remain seated, and if you don't want tea and coffee, you just, and make your way out. But let's stand together and say the blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, both now and forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Right. Thank you all for coming to church. <laughs>